grace have enough faith to call out to the master. Where I'm trying to go, Jesus is already there. He gives me an invitation to come. There's no one or nobody that is stronger than the God we serve. Welcome back to one of our Bible studies here at Mount Belton Missionary Baptist Church, 1620 Helena Street, right here in the wonderful city of Jacksonville, Florida. I'm so glad you'll be able to join in us this Tuesday evening. And if you've been listening the last couple of weeks, I've been doing a series called Dealing with the Disciples, and I'm going to bring that series to a conclusion tonight. Uh, I started off, I started talking about Peter. I started talking about Andrew. Last week, we dealt with the Sons of Thunder the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And what I decided to do instead of uh, stretching it out, trying to deal with each one of the disciples, I want to deal with all the disciples as a group this evening and bring it to a conclusion. And then on next week, we'll start another lesson with our Bible study. But tonight, like I said, I wanted to bring the dealing with the disciples to a conclusion. Now you may ask yourself, why deal with the disciples? We had no choice. The reason I chose that is because Jesus deals with us and he deals with us individually and collectively. He deals with us as a group, as the body of Christ and those things which we bring to present back to him. That's what I love about having the gifts from God. The gifts of God differ from the talents that you have. The gifts that you have are given to you so you can give those gifts back. You may can sing, you may can dance, you may have a, a, a nice voice to speak with, but it depends on who your audience is and the purpose behind what you're doing. When that talent becomes a gift and you recognize it as being a gift, then you present that gift back to the giver, that being of God. So what he shows us in this series that I dealt with is personalities exist through everyone. We dealt with Peter, who seemed to be what we call in these days a bipolar person. Sometimes Jesus referred to him as Simon. Sometimes he referred to him as Peter. Sometimes he even referred to him as Simon Peter. I always like to say that's when he didn't exactly know, even though he did. We can't fool God. But he kind of dealt with him and shows us a perfect example of dealing with individuals that can go this way and that way. And sometimes you never know which person in front of you that you're dealing with. We dealt with Andrew, the one I call the go-getter, because Andrew was actually the brother of Peter, and he was the one that introduced Peter to the Messiah. He said, we found him, and he brought Peter, even though Peter was what they called the leader of the disciples, we found out through Andrew, not only did he bring Peter, but Andrew was also responsible for finding that lad with the two fish and the five barley loaves that came and brought them before Jesus when Jesus fed the more than 5,000 people. It was that lad that was found by Andrew that brought what I call the bag lunch that he brought and shared it with Jesus, knowing that if he placed it in the master's hands, little would become much. And he was able to feed 5,000 men, not counting the women and children. So there could have been as many as 15,000 people there that day. Whatever the number was, they all got fed. And Jesus, even dealing with his disciples, after all those thousands of people had eaten, they were able to gather up 12 baskets together. So those that served, being the disciples, were able to serve others. But you know, there's something very strange about that issue. There were 12 baskets from the fragments that were left over from the bread and the fish, but there should have been 13 baskets. Because you have to ask yourself, where was Jesus' portion? 12 baskets for the disciples, but where was the 13th basket? But God takes care of us. We don't have to feed him. He feeds us and we feed back into what he's invested in us. So, and finally, on last week, we looked at James and John, who are called the sons of thunder, the sons of Zebedee. These were men that were very active. Remember when Jesus was going to Jerusalem and he came upon some individuals that the, the Samaritans and the Jews didn't get along and they knew that Jesus was heading to Jerusalem and they ran a bit of interference for us. They weren't able to get to the places that they planned on going. And Jesus told them, let's just go find another place to rest. 
and they went off into another area. But James and John were ready to confront because they said to Jesus, let's call on God to rain down fire upon our enemies. And Jesus said, no, we don't need to do that. And there were times that they had selfish requests because we examined when we looked in the book of Matthew's account of his gospel and the account of Mark in his gospel, that whether it was James and John or whether it was their mother Salome, one of them asked Jesus, when you get into your kingdom, can one of my sons sit on the left and one on the right hand side of you? And Jesus told them that that was not his decision to make, that was for the father to make, but he was teaching us how we are to be servants and we are to learn to serve people, not to become the ones being served. So as we look at the relationships with the disciples, that we understand that Jesus' relationship with the disciples was a perfect example of trust, loyalty, and commitment. The disciples were in the role of friends, followers, students, and they learned how to become servants. We found ourselves as members in the body of Christ walking in these same roles. Our relationship with Christ is a reflection of our relationships with each other. Friendship requires you to put the needs of others in front of your own because you love them. A great friendship should have trust, respect, honesty, loyalty, and love. Many of our friendships slash relationships in life have been like the latest movie to hit the theater. It's only around for a limited time. Realistically, Jesus' relationship with his disciples began and grew over three year and three and a half year period. That's how long his ministry was. But what they experienced with him during that time would last for a lifetime. Some years ago, me and Pastor Heron would have a conversation with Dr. James Sampson, pastor over at um, First New Zion. Um, and we were there and he said something to us that was very astonishing. He said that you have different levels of relationships. You have your associates, you have your affiliates, and you have your confidants. So I, I had to look into what that really meant and I wanted to share that with you. Your associates are those people that you identify with based on things that you share and have in common in the way you think, play, or the way that you live. A partner or colleague in business or at work, you may have memberships in an organization and make a person being associate or you be in association with them. Then affiliates, affiliates are very similar to associates. That person or persons may be a member of an organization that you are part of that's attached to a larger body. Um, it may be like we are in church. Here, we are part of Emmanuel Progression Progressive a Baptist Association, which is linked to the Florida General Baptist Association, which is linked to the National Baptist Association. So what I reason I bring that up is because we have people that we know of, but we may not have a personal relationship with them. It's like I know who T.D. Jakes is. Most of you probably do. T.D. Jakes has no idea who I am, but that's how I live. I'm glad that I'm in association with the bodies that are under the body of Christ, but I'm glad that we're under Christ, that we're under the Father, because the Father knows us because he made us. So you have these friendships that are by association. I hope that T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and all these people that you see on television, I hope they would count me as a friend and I hope they love me with agape love the same way that I do, that unconditional love. But we don't call each other on the phone. We don't have each other's phone numbers. We're not friends like that. That friend is the confidant. That's that third one. That person that you have a personal relationship with. And with a confidant, these are the people that you trust dearly. A person with whom one shares secrets or private matters, trusting them to not repeat it. You've got to be really careful when it comes to that. And we as pastors and teachers it is, and counselors, it is imperative that we must learn how to counsel our members and keep their information private. It makes no sense to go to someone 
with your closest shared information and have them publicize it like they're USA Today and pass your information onto other people that are waiting on the opportunity to turn your misery into their own party. We have got to be able to keep things confidential. There are things that people have come to me about that I don't share with my wife because it's not fair to that individual. Those things need be, to be shared between me and that person and the Lord. That's why we take our burdens to the Lord and we leave them there. He didn't say for you to take those things to your pastors and to your other leaders so that they can blurt those out to the other membership. You might as well come up and give a somewhat testimony in front of the church body if you want to share it with everyone. But that's what brings us from associates and affiliates into confidants. The disciples were Jesus' confidants. And to, and to really tell you the truth about it, he had that inner circle, Peter, James, and John, that were his closest confidants, that he shared things with them that he didn't share with others. One of the biggest things that I noticed that Christ shared with them was even information on the betrayer. If you look closely to the story of what happened in the upper room when he, Jesus turned the Passover supper to the Last Supper, there's a very inter interesting thing that happened when it concerns Judas. What he did was he said to them that there's one of you. He said this to all the disciples. There's one of you that would betray me. And they began to ask, is it I? Is it I? even Judas himself knowing what his mission was all about? Even Judas said, is it I? And since the positioning around the table that evening with Peter and John being close to Jesus, Jesus shared some information with them. He said, for the one that I take this sop with, that I dip this sop, that would be the one that would betray me. What's so interesting about this piece of information is first and foremost, Jesus honored Judas before Judas betrayed him because that taking of that sop was an honorary gesture that was done to an individual that night during the Passover supper. Jesus took that sop and he dipped it and he presented it to Judas. Now Peter, James and John were right there and they knew that Jesus had just said that the one that I give the sop is the one that will betray me. But miraculous, miraculously, and you have to know when God is working in a situation. What he did was he allowed those individuals, those three in that inner circle, his closest confidants, to hear this information. But they did not act upon it. They could have gotten in the face of Judas and said, why are you going to betray our Christ? Why are you doing this? This doesn't make sense. But the Bible shows that none of this happened. What happened was when Jesus honored him with that sop, he told him, first of all, the devil got inside of Judas where, the, where Judas could not change his mind or his mission. And Jesus told him, for what you're going to do, do it swiftly, do it quickly. And he was dismissed. And the mindset of the disciples, since Judas was the person that carried the purse, that was the accountant for the disciples, we'll call it. They thought that he was just going off to either set up things to pay for the meal in the house that they were in that night or take care of other financial business for their whole group, the disciples and Jesus. So they did not know uh, it. Jesus, with the way that he works, had that thought slip their mind so they were not able to run in an interference. And I've even told people that the most important person in the life of Christ that night early that morning, dealing with him going to the sacrificial cross was not Peter, James, or John, but it was Judas. Judas was the motivating factor that kept Jesus on his mission to leave from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane to the cross to die for us. So we understand that you have associates in friendship, you have affiliates in friendship, but then that inner circle, those people that are close to you, that care about you, are your confidants. Jesus was not just the savior, but he was also a friend, a teacher, and mentor that walked with his disciples 
for three years instructing them in their spiritual life. I have six practical life lessons Jesus taught the disciples that I want to share with you and I will conclude this lesson. The first is kingdom greatness is measured by humanity. In Matthew chapter 18, verse three, Jesus says this. Truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. It's amazing that as the older we get, the more sophisticated we get when from the onset of our lives, the gospel and the teachings of Jesus have been so simple. We as humans make these things become complicated. But he says that unless you change and become like children, he says, leave that sophisticated way of thinking alone and keep it simple. That's what we used to say when I used to sell cars. We had this term called kiss, which means keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> Don't keep it stupid. But you are the stupidity that keeps things complicated, that makes things complex. What people don't understand. The gospel is so simple. Jesus was born of a virgin. He died. And on the third day, he rose with all power in his hand and all authority. He is God. He is part of the Trinity, the Godhead of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's so easy that a child can understand this. But the older we get, the more we seem to complicate it. The second thing that Jesus presents to disciples that everything he presents to disciples is for us as well. Violence is not God's answer to sinfulness. Remember that same garden of Gethsemane where Peter cut off the ear of the servant and Jesus picked it up and put it back on and told him to put away his knife. Jesus is not about Violence. We learned that through the mission of Martin Luther King and the things that he did through the civil rights movement for us during the 60s. Those things, even though I don't care what nobody says, we've still not overcome. But God has not changed. God is still looking out for us and God still cares for us. So he says violence is not the answer. If you look at Luke chapter nine, verse 55, it says this. But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the son of man did not come to destroy man's lives, but to save them. Jesus came to save. There are three points in which you're being saved. That's that point in which you accept Christ. That initial point where you surrender to him, he becomes your savior. Then there's a second um, level of salvation where you are constantly being saved. That's throughout our life after you've accepted Christ. Throughout his life, throughout our lives, He's constantly saving us day by day. Then after our death, we live and we are saved because we live eternally with him. Three levels of salvation that we all experience. Some, of, some people I'm trying to get you to that first level to accept Christ as your savior. But that second level is why most of us, a lot of us that are, are watching and learning through, through Bible studies at different churches under different leaderships. We, that's our maturation process. That's the process that we are maturing. That's a part of our earthly salvation. The third thing, choose words carefully. They hold power. That's what Jesus taught the disciples. And we learn from what he taught them once again. Choose words carefully. Words hold power. He gives us a great illustration in Matthew chapter 12, verse 36, where he says, but I tell you, that everyone would have to give account on the day of judgment for every empty word they have spoken. You can't just run out there and say what you want to. You can't just curse people out without consequences. You can't tell lies on people without those lies coming back to haunt you. It's better to tell the truth because the truth is easier to remember. You start having a chain of lies. You got to tell a lie to help you remember the first lie and want to help you remember the second lie. No, just tell the truth because the truth, according to what the Bible says, will make men free. I like living in freedom. I have to tell the truth no matter how embarrassing it may become or what situations may come from the truth. It's best to stick with the truth because Jesus is the truth. He is not a lie. He is who he is and he is what he is. He is all about the truth. That's something that he also taught the disciples 
and lessons that flow through to us. The fourth thing, earthly riches can be a hindrance to spiritual growth. I spoke this past Sunday. My message was who's carrying who? And it talked about Baal and talked about Nebo, these idol gods that had been formed by man that they placed upon these cattle, these beasts. And after a while, those idol gods become a burden for you to carry. They get heavy. They fall off. You have to move those gods around. But we serve a God that moves us. God, you don't have to carry God physically. You carry him in your heart and by your actions and by the things that you do. But the truth is, God is carrying us. He's got the whole world. Remember that song from when we were little? He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got the whole wide world in his hands. He still has this whole world in his hands and he has room enough in his hands for more burdens. We just have to learn how to take our burdens to the Lord and let him take care of those burdens for us. Matthew chapter 6 verse 24 says this, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. I'm here to tell you, my brother, I'm here to tell you, my sister, be very careful. God wants you to be successful. He has already desired the things in your life to lead, to work together so that you can be successful. But he does not want you to, once you become successful, to let money become your master. He is your master. He deserves the glory. So you have to be careful. Be thankful. In all things, give thanks, but don't get to the point that your money becomes your master and your worship falls away from the one that gave you all those things that you desire. The fifth thing, conditions of the heart matter most to God. He says once again in Matthew, this time, chapter 15, verse eight, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. You cannot be like a salesperson with the gift of gab and let the things out of your mouth misrepresent the things that are in your heart. God knows how you truly feel about him and how you feel about others. It's not about what you're saying. It's about your actions, because like they said for a long time, actions truly speak louder than words. So let your actions speak for you. If you love God, you will love the people of God. You love his creations. You love the poor. You love the rich. You love the middle class. You love everybody unconditionally. That's what your actions do. You give more than you try to get. You make sure that everybody eats, not that you eat and get fat and everybody else gets skinny, but you help, you donate, you give to good charities that have good causes and bring about happiness to other people. Jesus was a giver, for God so loved the world that he gave. What did he give? He gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. These are lessons that he taught his disciples that they began to spread the gospel worldwide. And that's our mission as a church. We are to continue in the footsteps of the disciples. We are to learn from Jesus and we are to spread the word of God throughout all the nations. Finally, the sixth thing, prayer in private brings power in public. I gotta say that again, prayer in private brings power in public. Jesus spoke once again. I know I've been on Matthew a lot, but there's some powerful messages and the, the, the things that the disciples were taught, a lot of focus was in the gospel according to Matthew. In chapter six, verse five, he says this, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. Look, 
there are riches, crowns, gowns, robes waiting for you, even mansions in heaven waiting for you. God is saying that these hypocrites, these people that say one thing and do another thing, they love to give you rules and regulations, but they don't adhere to them themselves. He's saying they love giving out, but they don't love giving up their positions and their authority. Look, he says, don't be like them. When you pray, there's a difference between a devotional prayer in church. There's a difference between an offertory prayer. There's even a difference between a consecration prayer. We have consecration prayers out with, with the uh, public in the church doing our devotions and before devotions. But we have consecration prayers back in the pastor study that prepare the ministers for their assignments to be worship leaders as they come out into the public to join in with the congregation in the sanctuary for fellowship. We all have to know the appropriate prayers at the right time. But what he's saying here is all your prayers can't be public prayers. Look, my sister, my brother, you've got to learn how to get in your prayer closet. And your prayer closet does not have to be a physical closet. It's that place where you go so you can be by yourself with the Lord. There are some times that you have to go to the Lord where you can be all by yourself. There are some things you can't tell your spouse. You can't tell your brothers and sisters. You can't even tell your parents that you've just got to take it to the Lord in prayer. We have an intercessor called the Holy Spirit that when Jesus left this earth to ascend back into heaven, he said he would not leave us comfortless. But he would leave another. That word another in the Greek means someone that possesses the same ability and power. He left us with the intercessor, the Holy Spirit that listens to our prayers and he interprets them to God. But let me tell you how great the Holy Spirit is. Not only does he listen, he listens to your heart. The Bible says that there are times that we can't even speak, that he interprets our moans and our cries. The Holy Spirit knows what you need because the Holy Spirit is God. And also, he is a part of the Godhead. So he takes this to the Father. He is our intercessor. He stands in the gap for us and he submits to the Father what we really need. And we serve a God that does not. I thank you, Lord. He does not always give us what we desire and give us what we want because we're like babies to him. Babies cry for everything when they're hungry, when they're wet, when they're sleepy. And surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly at all, we as adults, we do the same thing as babies. That's why he first told them about humility, to go back into the thought processes of a child. That's what we have to do. Jesus had these 12 apostles, but he actually had more disciples than just the 12. He had a whole follower, which was inclusive of women. Yes, Jesus had followers that were women, one of which we spoke of before, Salome, Mary Magdalene, even his own mother, Mary. They followed him. They followed him from place to place, and they were also taught. We are disciples of Christ. We are learning from him and the things he has to offer to us. So you have to get into the word of God. It's just like having a relationship with someone else, that person that you love. In order to better your relationship, you have to understand and learn more things about them. We as people change. We get older, we get grayer, we don't move the way that we used to move, but God still moves in us and he moves around us and he cares and he loves us. So you have to make a decision for yourself to learn more about him. And I guarantee you, he will make your life better. God is strengthening you for your journey, but you cannot go through this journey by yourself. Will you accept Christ as being your savior if you already have not? Can he be your Lord and savior this evening? If so, if you accept him, we want you to get in contact with a church in your area because we may not be in your area. I know just like my daughter stays in Atlanta, my granddaughter, they watch our services here and people watch throughout the nation and they contact us. And we want to be able to pray with you. We want you to not just 
stay in your homes, even though you may have made them into a sanctuary for our worship services, but you still have to leave those sanctuaries and deal with the world. We want you to get in touch with a pastor, a good Bible teaching church in your area where you can mature. Remember that part of salvation I talked about, that middle part. Your maturation process is happening and available for you. You just have to step into it. But the first step is to accept Christ. And then you have to get yourself to a place where you can learn who he is and what he expects from you. I'm so glad that you were able to join in with us this evening. We look forward to seeing you again in our broadcast with our Sunday school on Sunday mornings from 1020 to 1040 and our morning worship at 11 a.m. each and every Sunday right here at Mount Bethel Missionary Baptist Church. Please don't forget about God in everything you do because he's not forgotten about you. And good evening.